She's the author of several journal articles, many of which deal with various aspects of hazards and natural hazards and disaster resilience. Her interest in the topic was sparked by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill when she recognized the governance challenges surrounding response and recovery to the spill were similar to public service provision in the developing world, which had been the focus of her graduate studies. She notes that both must balance fiscal and human capital constraints with prescribed institutional bounds while addressing underlying social and infrastructure vulnerabilities. Both fields also involve high stakes as human well-being is dependent upon the outcome. She has a PhD in political science from Texas A&M, an MA in political science from LSU, and a BS in political science from Texas A&M. Quite, quite the Aggie through and through. Indeed. So with that, um, Ashley, you can share your screen and we'll start. Sounds great. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here and really excited um, to, to talk to you guys about local governance. Let's make sure everything's looking right. Okay, Josh says it is. Just wanted to make sure. So what we're talking about today is local governance in the context of natural hazards and answering the question of what is good governance? I wanna start off by um, telling you guys a story related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. As you probably know, the, um, this oil spill happened on April 20th, 2010, when the BP operated Macondo well exploded off the coast of Louisiana. It spewed crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico um, the drilling rig, the Deepwater Horizon is the name of the rig, or was the name, caught fire later that same day, killing 11 of 126 um, crew members and injuring another 17 persons. Two days later, the rig sunk and oil continued to gush into the Gulf for a total of 87 days until the well was successfully capped on July 15th. By that time, nearly 5 million bar barrels or over 200 million gallons of crude oil had been released into the Gulf. And this was about 20 times the volume associated with the historic Exxon Valdez tanker accident of 1989. 92,500 square miles of surface water were contaminated. This affected the states of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. 100,000 birds from 92 different species were estimated to have died. Tens of thousands of dolphins and whales were exposed to the oil with record high number of dolphin deaths following the oil spill. Century old deep sea corals were smothered by oil and fish, fishing, shrimping, and oil industry economic activities were completely stalled and halted, putting the livelihoods of many along the Gulf Coast at risk. Social and mental health declined, and physical effects from oil exposure have been documented and are continuing to be documented um, from this event. In the days following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill concerned elected officials and business leaders from Baldwin County, Alabama met together at a local realty office to brainstorm ideas of how to manage this unprecedented event. Of particular importance for this group were the economic and health impacts of the spill that were compounded by continued impacts from Hurricane Katrina years before. This meeting included the mayors of Gulf Shore, Orange, Beach and Foley, as well as representatives from the Alabama Gulf, Show, Alabama Gulf Coast Chamber of Commerce, as well as tourism representatives, community college representatives, and Economic Development Alliance folks. From this gathering emerged the Coastal Resiliency Coalition, which is known as the CRC, and they called their meeting place the War Room as the organization led the fight for the survival of local businesses and economies. 
The primary focus of the CRC was initially to help businesses withstand the economic shock of the oil spill and ultimately to restore economic well-being and growth to the Tri-City area, including Gulf Shores, Foley Beach, and Orange Beach. Businesses in Baldwin County relied directly or indirectly and continue to on tourism, and the county generates a quarter of the state's tourism revenue. So this revenue obviously dropped significantly following the oil spill when beaches were closed. And um, Baldwin County actually reported a 9% drop in tourist and travel related employment in 2010, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's the equivalent of over 2,500 jobs. In addition, overall tourism earnings decreased significantly, um, reaching almost $100 million in um, lost revenue. The oil spill coincided with the economic downturn that negatively affected the entire nation at the time. So you have the recovery from Hurricane Katrina, the economic effects of this oil spill, and then the Great Recession. So what was going on is that these businesses were really hard hit. And as a result, um, the community was feeling it in terms of mental health issues, Things like suicide rates had increased, domestic violence had increased, drug abuse, alcohol abuse had also increased. Um, so they were seeing the spillover of these economic losses. So the CRC started meeting twice a week and in between the meetings, they held focus groups with like local stakeholder groups. And um, they basically were a forum for communication among local businesses. And then they also started to bring in public health officials, education experts and others to connect these business and economic interests to related um, social well-being. In all of the CRC provided interorganizational cooperation and connected people with um, their government, as well as with public, private, and civic organizations. It promoted economic diversity and addressed community and mental and physical health needs. It looked to protect environmental assets where it could. And then it formally became in 2012, a 501c nonprofit organization. Its legacy was described in 2012 by then president um, of the Chamber of Commerce, Donna Watts, as being like a family. And if the house catches on fire, you're going to get together and meet there. And it's the CRC or the war room is where they go to help each other to communicate and to find resources to deal with the issue. From the article that you read, um, uh, that I sent before um, this talk, we have seen this continue, this legacy of the CRC and this collaboration and cooperation and resilience culture through the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the news article, we saw that this was a, co a collaborative framework that could be leveraged to deal with the impacts of the COVID-19 health crisis, particularly that economic impact on businesses. And what's key here is that cross-sector um, communication, collaboration, and organizational adaptation that's been facilitated by it. Overall, it facil has facilitated a culture of resilience among this community, and they know they can deal with the effects of COVID-19 because together they have dealt with multiple crises and disasters in the past. So what this story is, is an example of good or resilient hazards governance. And we're going to walk through why and how um, it's an example of that and how that might be replicated in other places. First of all, what the CRC did was leverage what is called by some researchers and academics as interactive governance. That's a, um, a phrase coined by Kuhlman. This is the idea that it's the whole of the interactions taken to solve societal problems and to create societal opportunities that is actual governance. So here we're not thinking of governance as top down, where it's from the government or public agencies down to the community, down to businesses and, and community organizations. Rather, as this figure depicts, 
there are realms of public, private, and civic um, organizations and collectives that work together. And that's the interactions and the intersection of that working together that is governance. And this requires, or this allows for a broader set of policy instruments and management and tools to solve really difficult problems. And it gives you some diverse sets of partners to work on innovating and, and adapting. So for example, with the CRC, um, one of the things that came out of the Coastal Resilience Coalition was the idea from some of the businesses to actually create a video following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. In addition to some other events, once it was safe to eat seafood and visit the beaches. So they use that innovation and that knowledge that clearly came outside of the public sector. You wouldn't expect your, your local government to come up with that idea and that expertise to promote local businesses and try to restore some economic um, revenue and stability. So when we think about this interactive governance, what we can think about is how governance isn't just formal laws and plans and contracts, but it's also about leveraging local knowledge. It's about building on local culture and shared values. And it's about um, also leveraging and nurturing informal agreements and social norms that might exist. So all of these things taken together help solve collective social problems. The other aspect is it's not just about interactive governance. This approach that the CRC took really reflects an idea of adaptive management. And adaptive management is the idea that you cooperate with one another and you deliberate among community groups to co-produce knowledge and define management goals. It's the idea that you're dealing with incomplete information and uncertainty, so you're going to think about a system and you're going to try to learn and experiment by doing and work together to solve what political scientists call wicked problems. Wicked problems are those problems that are complex. They inherently are uncertain. There is no clear cut answer or, or technical answer to them. There's no silver bullet. They usually lie at the intersection of social and ecological systems. So where those interactions are. So they're very messy and they can't be solved with just one intervention. They really require um, complex solutions, collaborative solutions um, to those complex problems. So we have this idea about interactive governance and adaptive management going hand in hand, being an approach that we're seeing with CRC. I doubt that they, the individuals involved would have articulated it that way, but we can understand it that way. Second, um, they were, they're an example of good governance because what the CRC did was focus on building capacity. And when we think about resilience in the context of hazards and disasters, it really gets down to adaptive capacities. So this is a model of resilience um, that I created several years ago to help conceptualize the disaster phases and how we can think about resilience within them. And the idea is that we're building adaptive capacities in the early phases of a disaster. This is before a disaster happens. So when we are doing things to mitigate and reduce risk, when we're doing things to prepare for specific hazards and potential disasters, we're building capacities of ourselves, of our households, of our communities. And we're doing that in several different domains. Um, when the disaster strikes is when those capacities are put to test. And what we know about disasters is that the definition of them is it's an intersection of a natural hazard with society in a way that overwhelms the capacities of that society. So when we have this disaster hit, communities are then thrown into what I call the adaptive process where they have to improvise, they have to coordinate, they have to engage with one another. And it's really a test of endurance and social learning and experimentation. So it gets back to that idea of adaptive management. So there within the adaptive process, capacities are tested. That's where communities respond and start the recovery process that then feeds back into 
building capacities for the future. So the CRC is a model of good hazard governance because it was focused on restoring economic capacities, but it also kept an eye, an eye on the fact that economic capacities are coupled with human and social capacities, that all of these things intersect and that in dealing with one, you have to deal with the others. The other way to think about building um, capacity for adaptation is think about how over time you have to respond to a disaster. So what this graph shows you is that we have a lot of activity in the emergency response phase of a disaster that levels off a little bit in restoration, then picks up more with recovery when you're trying to reconstruct and repair um, infrastructure as well as social structures and then drops down a little bit more with risk reduction and mitigation. So capacity building activities are fluctuating across disaster phases. But the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that capacity building fluctuates over disasters. So the CRC is a really good example of this. We have recovery from Hurricane Katrina overlapping with response to the deep water oil spill. And on the heels of that, we also saw the Great Recession, which was another economic shock to their system. So when you think broadly about shocks and disturbances to a community, you can see those overlapping crises and disasters that requires capacity building on different levels for those different events. Um, and there, this capacity building effort gets really intense when you're dealing with these cascading effects over disasters. The third thing that the CRC um, did that is that demonstrates really good hazard governance is it accepted hazard uncertainty. And we saw that in the news article um, that we read that the members as well as the broader community when CRC um, became active and an established part of that community, they built a culture of resilience in the sense that they were willing to accept uncertainty and know that they just have to adapt. So when we're thinking about hazards, we have to recognize that there's incredible uncertainty associated with climate change today, that there's increasing intensity and frequency of natural hazards, that they're highly unpredictable and uncertain. A good example of that is Hurricane Harvey that hit Texas in 2017. This storm track um, on the slide shows you how weird that storm was. It meandered across Texas and stalled out as a category one inland, went back out and picked up speed and went over past the Houston area to Louisiana. The point being that that was because of steering currents that were unpredictable due to warming and warming Gulf waters um, and climate change. So Fast forward past Hurricane Harvey, what we know today is that we have cascading disaster threats. So across natural, technological, and public health crises have now become very much of our, our reality. So we know that natural disasters can create technological hazards. They're called NATEC disasters. Um, the shiny water that you're seeing on the side of, side of the slide is actually um, spill from a Superfund site in Houston caused by flooded waters from Hurricane Harvey. So that's where we see natural and technological disasters impacting one another. You add on to that, like we did last year, hurricane evacuations during the COVID crisis or other health crises, and you get a lot of uncertainty. You get uncertainty about what we know, how to deal with things. So the scenarios that we plan for are literally thrown out the window. You get unknowns about how people are going to react and behave in response to these as well. And so this uncertainty and accepting uncertainty, being comfortable with adaptation and improvisation becomes critical um, in terms of hazard governance. And the fourth thing that the CRC did um, that exemplifies good hazard governance is it invested in public-private partnerships. In fact, I would categorize it on the whole as a public-private partnership. It was community-driven. It had co-leadership that came from the bottom up. So this was local government 
um, officials getting together with concerned business leaders that were building on their personal and organizational trust to create something new and to create something that could be a forum for adaptation for their community. When you have partnerships like that, it's critical that they're supported by human and physical capital. What I mean by that is that you have the expertise that you need for the things you're trying to tackle and you have funding to support the activities that you're undertaking. So on the local level, sometimes that means you have to recruit those things, right? And solicit them, um, everything from bringing in experts from local universities and researchers to applying for grants and other types of funding support um, from outside agencies because local governments are often really strapped for resources. The other thing that these public-private partnerships do is that they incorporate diverse forms of knowledge and they're not afraid to be open to that knowledge. And that's really critical, particularly when you're thinking about leveraging local knowledge in natural hazard governance. So the idea that local communities have some collective wisdom about the way um, local ecosystems respond to natural hazards is important to bring in or even just local knowledge that can serve as a historical marker that 10 years ago, when we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, this is who we called and this is who we brought in to deal with the mental health issues in schools and to provide lunches for students. Let's do that again in the COVID crisis, you know, things like that. So that diverse forms of knowledge is critical to tap into. And then it's also about being open to diverse and innovative tools that are perhaps outside the, the scope and the wheelhouse of public agencies, but that private and civic organizations and groups can undertake. And that they can do so without being constrained by formal laws and plans, but instead leverage cultural and value norms or informal um, agreements. Okay, so, so far to answer our question, what we've seen is that good or resilience hazard governance approaches governance as that integrative governance. So it's about collaboration and it's about adaptation through adapt adaptive management. Second of all, it focuses on building capacity, particularly across disaster events as those become compounding. It accepts uncertainty and invests in public private partnerships. So my understanding is that many or the majority of you are planning students and you're probably saying, okay, well, that's nice, but where are the, where's the plans? Where are the planning tools? What specific ordinances were passed to make this good hazard governance or what specific economic development activities did they undertake? So you may not like this, but I'm going to sidestep that question by saying, what I'm trying to impart to you guys today is the foundation that can then have policies and programs on top of it and tools laid on top of it. And those can go in a number of different directions, depending on the community's needs, the disaster context, and um, what's available in terms of resources. So building codes and environmental restoration, public education efforts, structural mitigation, recovery plans, and zoning. Those are all policies and programs that can be implemented. You're, the tools that you can use are your entire toolkit, right? Once you have this foundation of sound and good hazard governance. Another way of thinking of this is like this. Governance can be defined as the social and political negotiation of the objectives of hazard management, while management are the actions to carry those objectives out. So the governance part of it is inherently social. It requires trade-offs. It requires compromise and negotiation among parties. And once those objectives are agreed upon, once the collective has a vision, then you can move forward um, with really proactive and innovative policies and programs. You can use the tools at your disposal to um, implement and create those. So we're focusing on the foundation here. 
And what we've seen is that the Coastal Resilience Center in Alabama exemplifies these four things. But there are a few other things I would challenge you to think about in terms of um, what's needed for resilient hazard governance. The fifth thing is to think in systems. And this loops back some to adaptive management because adaptive management with embracing uncertainty inherently approaches problems from a systems level. But what I'm talking specifically about here, and I'm really borrowing heavily from the natural resource management literature, is that as hazards managers, whether you're an emergency manager or in a disaster related profession, if you can take a step back and look at the bigger picture of the larger social ecological system, you can gain some insights on what interventions are going to do and what they have done in the past, rather than looking at it from a narrow focus. The idea here is that we have social processes and ecological processes, human components and ecological components that are overlapping. They're not just overlapping, they are intersecting and interacting. And there's an integration of them where the impacts on one will impact the other. There's an interdependency there that we can trace and we can start looking at the roots of risk socially, ecologically, right? So here I'm talking about social vulnerabilities or exposure to hazards. On the ecological side, I'm talking about how um, the ecosystem has been altered. There's erosion, which causes more exposure. And we can start tracing where those interactions are and then creating policies and interventions and all those management programs to deal with them. This is particularly important as we face these wicked problems of, of hazards governance. Those problems where hazards are increasingly coupled where we see in, for example, areas of Texas that have floods in the spring but are experiencing drought that same year. Those are very different hazards to manage and they require understanding the larger social ecological system and um, those interactions, understanding those interactions between the two to really get at sound governance. The sixth is, to be guided by the principle of equity. And here what I mean is promoting inclusion of a diversity of experiences and promoting the reduction of vulnerabilities for all. This has to recognize that hazards management from emergency management to other disaster related professions, including planning, can actually recreate marginalization of some groups and may increase inequities in society. We have to put a different lens on to understand equity issues, and we have to challenge those legacies, be them social, institutional, organizational, or even economic, that might increase inequities, perpetuate marginalization and vulnerability, um, particularly for underrepresented groups in our community. Some of this is recognizing what social scientists call the intersectionality of risk. This is the idea that people have different identities, needs, and capacities, and these change. They're not static, and they affect the ability to prepare for and cope with and respond to hazards. When you start understanding the intersectionality of risk and looking at equity issues with that in mind, you can start disentangling, again, some of those roots of risk and understanding how planning interventions, for example, might need to be coupled with social interventions. And that to reduce risk in one area of the hazards might mean actually reducing vulnerabilities overall in a social economic component. And um, that siloed interventions aren't enough is the point here. All right, so let's put our knowledge to work. I gave you guys a chapter to read of, of um, that I contributed to a recent book on Houston and its legacy with Hurricane Harvey. Houston is the only very large American city without zoning. There's no comprehensive set of guidelines to steer development away from flood risk in the city. 
Instead, what we have there is a patchwork of land use controls ranging from deed restrictions to building codes that are actually governed by local special districts, not even by the city itself. All right, so based on what we've learned here today, how would you guys approach improving hazard governance? I know this is a challenging question. What comes to mind? You can go ahead and go on unmute if you want or put it in the chat, either way. I was gonna say, based on um, you know all of the readings and what we've been talking about is just tapping into the local community um, to really understand you know, what their experiences have been and just like historically as well as personally. Okay, so community engagement might help start disentangling some of this. Anyone else? I Thanks, think that, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I think that all of the levels of government should be involved, sort of bringing everyone to the table because it's hard to um, work if not everyone's there and actually like engage, uh, sorry, um, engage with each other. So just bringing everyone in. Okay, so collaboration, and engagement across levels of government as well, in addition to bringing in community. Thanks, Julia. That was good. Anyone? Um, I think it's also very important to understand the economic and developmental motivations that are already in place. Yeah. So kind of analyzing why why are we developing in these areas? Why are we doing these things that now we're trying to, you know, mitigate um, the damage that we're trying to mitigate? We're trying to understand the financial systems in place that have gotten us to this position in the first place. Yeah, Pierce, thanks for um, challenging us to think about the systems because that becomes a bit overwhelming, but it also is really illuminating, right? When you look at the systems, not just today, <laughs> But you think about them historically, and some of the, the book chapter I wrote focused on how that development happened over time in the city of Houston to put parts of the city at particular risk and exposure to floods. What we can understand is what's prevalent and what, what has the voice of power in this area is development interest, right? And um, to start dismantling that or at least elevating community interests, particularly of minority and marginalized communities in the city of Houston is going to require probably some institutional changes. And that's what I think Julia was getting at is that if we can bring government on multiple levels together, perhaps we can start steering it in a way that is looking at the larger picture instead of being dominated by developers' short-sightedness to develop one neighborhood or one community, right? Okay, let's keep on talking about Houston and challenging ourselves to put this knowledge to action. Following Hurricane Harvey, there were new laws that were passed to require homeowners to disclose if property had ever flooded before. The idea behind this was that you could manage population growth and settlement issues within the private housing and insurance market. So if we make it disclosures in the private market, the private market can deal with it. What equity issues might arise with this approach? Um, it just benefits people that can you know, fill out the paperwork. Cause it's like, if you're asking whose houses have flooded in Houston, the answer is everybody. Um, at one point or another. So like your resources to actually get it done, like directly impact you know, how you're going to receive help with this. Like Harvey was a big deal because people in Katy got messed up. Like rather, whereas, you know, uh, the 2015 storm and the 2016 storm didn't exactly go that way. Yeah, I think you're getting close to it, Hardy. Um, definitely touching upon some of it. So it's about access, right? I think that's what you're talking about, to resources and abilities to um, comply with this law. Any other thoughts? Uh, is it not including renters? Is it only home buyers? Okay, yes, absolutely. Renters are left out here. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. 
would the would it have a depressive effect on on housing values and rents, which could end up sorting low income people into flood prone areas? Exactly. There you go. So if you're thinking spatially and you're thinking about this law, first of all, where does it flood the most? Hardy was right that everyone has experienced some flood risk, more or less, in the city of Houston. But where is it really flooded? Where you're seeing floodwaters from Harvey up, up to where the windows are, over doors. It's in the south of Houston. The south of Houston, which is near industrial sites, which was um, resettled uh, in the 50s and 60s as affluent families went other places. They went north, they went to suburbs of, of Houston to the west and to the east, northeast. The south of Houston then was populated by minority communities predominantly and low income families that could afford the low prices there and quite frankly couldn't afford anything else. So they are now going to be penalized by these types of laws because they're having to disclose how much their home flooded which means that that home in comparison to a home in a new subdivision that is in the outskirts of Houston of the same value, um, when comparing the two, people are going to want the subdivision home, right? And so we get these compounding issues come from it, equity issues of it's, it becomes almost prejudiced against low income and, and minority communities. It's promoting urban sprawl because when you have new developments, guess what? You haven't flooded because your home's new. And in addition to that urban sprawl, we have compounding issues of new developments causing floods and old developments with runoff and the unforeseen effects. So all of this is equity issues, right? It's equity issues for people who are living in the older development, um, neighborhoods and communities. It's equity issues for low income families and minority communities and for those that lack access to resources um, that could um, actually help them benefit from this. So the, what I'm getting at here is this is an example of an intervention that Texas undertook in response to Harvey. And they said, you know what, we don't want to deal with this across the board, let's just let the private market deal with the private market instead of saying, okay, let's deal with this flooding issue on a cultural and social level. Let's bring in community organizations and their voice. Let's bring in public agencies to actually regulate this and the private market. So when you approach governance from a siloed perspective and you're looking at an intervention in just one aspect of it, it's missing that opportunity for interactive governance and it then hits challenges when it comes to resilience, right? Um, all right, here's another example. Uh, Fern, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, Fern. Oh, oh no, I just had an answer, but That's I, I fine. think we covered that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I did have one question on that. Um, just, I mean, looking here at the, even at some of the dates, like on, on these laws, I mean, the, the state legislature, I don't think, had just met before Harvey hit. And I don't think they met for another, or they didn't get anything done for another two years after. I don't think they met for another 15 months or 15 or 18 months. I mean, as far as collaborative processes at you know the institutional level, that seems unwise, I guess. Yeah, so the state legislator in Texas meets every two years. They set up the budget for the next two years. It's really unresponsive to disasters and crises. Um, and becomes particularly problematic. But the other part of that is that reflects the culture in Texas that um, is largely anti-big government. It, it reflects the idea that individuals and private markets and businesses should be able to come up with solutions to issues on their own. Um, and it does cut out quite a bit of collaboration that could happen or at least stymies it. Because if you have a disaster that you then have to wait 15 months for the state legislator to convene, all that collaboration, that momentum, that window of opportunity that's opened after a disaster is lost. So that's a really good point, Hardy. Um, 
similar issue with these regulations, in addition to disclosure, Harris County passed um, a, a law following Harvey that new buildings in the 100 year floodplain had to be built two feet above the 500 year floodplain. And the city of Houston passed a law that homeowners in 100 and 500 year floodplains have to meet free board requirements of two feet. So thinking specifically of this, um, these laws, are there equity issues here? And are there other governance issues you think? Is there anyone who hasn't had a, a question posed in a previous class? I mean, I, 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 I did want to mention, okay. I did want to mention, you know, sure. it kind of does raise obviously those equity issues again, because in order to elevate your home, that costs a lot of money. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, and it depending also on fee, it can, you know, obviously increase exponentially as far as costs. And a lot of low income communities just don't have the means to do that. So obviously it puts them at continuous risk and also puts them in a situation to then leave if they can't do that to their homes. Right, that's, that's right. It's also, while building codes are a good route to deal with risk, one way to really answer, one way to, to promote resilience hazard governance and to put in practices management that promote that is a diversity of risk reducing strategies. So a portfolio. And certainly I haven't um, put everything on these slides that the city of Houston and Harris County have done, but following Harvey, they were really focused on passing regulations for homeowners rather than approaching it more holistically. Mm -hmm. So we would also like to see, and I would have to do more research to know if the city of Houston has done this since in the last couple of years, investments in drainage and infrastructure, particularly in minority communities, for example. Investments in, um, you could even go so far as to argue things like investments in education programs for low income families to elevate their adaptive capacities and resources. Renters programs to educate them on risk and um, how to deal with flooding issues in the city would be a big part of that. Understanding insurance, right? I mean, the list could go on and on if you approach these issues of risk and resilience holistically. But again, what we're seeing here are these equity issues that um, are that emerge because of a focus on the homeowner and because of a focus on regulations of the homeowner that quite frankly, some communities just can't um, afford. I've seen this in other places um, throughout my research. In 2010 and 11, I did a lot of interviews along the Gulf Coast over in Alabama as well. Um, and in Mississippi, um, focusing on how they were recovering from Harvey and then Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And um, in Mississippi and Biloxi, what you saw were um, fishing communities, Vietnamese fishing communities that had been there for decades, um, completely gone. And um, they had moved or, or, or just been displaced and scattered and were not returning. And that was largely because they couldn't afford to after the regulations that were passed in the state that were intended to make homes more honestly safe for wind is what it was focused on. Retrofitting for wind and um, some, some codes that would make them more resilient. But what it in effect did was erase a culture um, in, in that community. All right, so in conclusion, What's good or resilience hazard governance? So what, what can you guys do as disaster related professions in your disaster related professions? You can pursue public, private and civic cooperation um, and co-leadership that's open to innovation, including innovative tools that are outside of public agencies. You can accept uncertainty and expect the unexpected so you're focusing here on adaptation as well as capacity building for that adaptation. 
think about those larger social ecological systems, consider equity issues and challenge legacies that perpetuate equity inequities. Just those little things, you know. So that's what I have, guys. Um, I hope that it gave you some ideas about governance as a whole. Let's see, I'm looking in, okay, the chat. Hardy is saying there's been some positive steps as far as green infrastructure, but that's about it. Although a lot of the issues regarding inequities are highlighted in their climate action plan, but that is yet to be implemented. And I think you're referring to the city of Houston. Hardy, is that right? There's also a comment here that it's interesting how many solutions are actually delegated to people instead of committed to by those in power. And that is a great comment. And I think it reflects also the need to engage communities and diverse stakeholders um, in conversations about solutions, right? Yeah, that's great. I'm just making some notes for myself. Um, I have a question here from, am I on mute? No. Okay, <laughs> from, I'm gonna combine the question posed by Kristen as well as Emma, because they were kind of similar. And, and I've found that that often happens is that there's lots of overlapping interest uh, in the issues that are presented. But basically I'll start off with Emma's question. If land use development plans continue to use 100 year floodplains, et cetera, while 100 and 500 year floods continue to happen on a much shorter time frame than this, how will we ever be able to plan our developments to be prepared for future flooding? And let me tack on to that, um, Kristen who says, why do municipalities continue to use the 100 year floodplain if it's proven that FEMA floodplains have failed to accurately account for flood risk and impacts? So Great sort of question. two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would really just pose these questions to you guys um, and your future in terms of practitioners or researchers on these issues. Where are we going to get the data um, and the information available to municipalities to inform them of their risk. So the reason why municipalities and homeowners um, rely on FEMA's 100 year floodplains is because it's been available information that is widely available. It's comparative, right? And um, even though research, including research that has been done by folks here at Texas A&M at Galveston, including Russell Blessing and Sam Brody, has shown that those floodplains are actually completely inaccurate. Um, what we, the reason we use them is because it's the lens by which we have been looking through. You have to replace it with something. Um, and to ask municipalities to come up with that on their own is not realistic. Um, so there really needs to be a restructuring of the way that we approach that information and data, but there also has to be a coupling of culture to go with that. So people more or less can get this idea of 100 and 500 year floods. And as they're experiencing those 100 and 500 year floods fairly frequently, they're understanding that that is a misnomer. So you have to tack on some type of new communication apparatus to whatever data is created to make it an effective risk um, tool. And some people have suggested using like color codes like you do for terrorism, right? Green, yellow, orange, red. Green meaning it's not in a floodplain, red, it's totally in a floodplain. I don't know what the answer is. I'm gonna leave it to you guys that are much more creative and smart than I am to figure that out in the future, but there has to be um, some changes with regards to how we deal with um, understanding the risks that we're at. Great, did that help you guys answer your question? Okay, um, I think I have time 
uh, for a couple more. This is great. So um, let me see. I think this is Josh's question. If I have it split out. Yeah, Josh. Um, so he asks, the new regulations in Houston seem to make it more expensive to replace old or dilapidated housing. What are the socioeconomic impacts? And you've kind of touched on that a little bit, but this is getting into the nitty gritty weeds. Yeah, you know, that's actually a research question that can be answered and probably is by some folks um, in the area. If you're interested in research in Houston, I would encourage you to look at the Speed Center at Rice University. They're doing a lot of good work, not just on um, hydrological models of flooding, but also socioeconomic impacts. Um, HARC, which stands for Houston Area Research Council, is also doing a lot of interesting survey data and social survey data, as well as others. I haven't personally looked into um, that, that research question, but it's certainly something that could be answered and tracked. What I would expect is that the socioeconomic impacts of these type of regulations are unequal and are disproportionately felt by those of lower income. The other uh, part of this that we haven't talked about are buyouts and um, offers of buyouts, where those go, where they're targeted. Um, and how they might provide opportunities for um, some families to start over. But there's a lot of questions about whether the buyout is equitable in terms of giving them the capital resource, the financial capital or resources to um, create a new home, to buy a new home uh, structure. And then there's a lot of questions about the social impacts of buyouts and moving. So if you live in a community, you've raised your children in a community, perhaps you yourself were raised in that community. If you accept a buyout and you have to move somewhere else in the city, and Houston is the third largest city in the nation, um, what happens to your community connections, to um, the school that your kids go to, the church that you go to? Is it too far now to drive to be part of that? So um, there's other aspects of it beyond just the financial ramifications. Yeah, so Julie kind of um, touched on that when she asked, in your opinion, what are the other, what are other realistic options for addressing repetitive losses other than property buyouts? Mm. And this, I mean, you've, you've talked a lot, a lot of some of the issues and some of the solutions in a broad context, but yeah, that's pretty specific. It's very specific, <laughs> and I wish I had a good answer for that. If I did, I I could um, help a lot of people. Um, you know, I think that there's no answer one size fits all. This is really where it has to be community driven, where um, collective knowledge and social learning becomes really critical. Um, in terms of how to deal with the natural and environmental risk you face um, while also leveraging the social and community resources you have. And so um, what does that mean? Does it mean elevation? I don't know. I mean, some, so some neighborhoods, for example, following Hurricane Harvey in New Orleans, like New Orleans East neighborhood, they now look like beach houses. They're elevated, you know, 20 feet in the air. Um, is that a good thing because they got to stay there? Is that a weird thing? Did people leave? Was there a patchwork recovery? Yes and yes. So I don't know. Um, I think this again gets back to these processes of governance are important. Embracing collective collaboration or embracing collaboration, diverse collaboration, embracing different forms of knowledge and being willing to deal with that uncertainty and adaptation and coming up with innovation matters. Another thing to look at would be things like the Rockefeller Resilience Cities Initiative and some of the innovations that they've been able to identify. 